Um, so, hi everyone and welcome to today's lecture. My name is Grace Folding and I'm a senior at Princeton High School in Princeton, New Jersey. Um, this is the second of five online lectures about climate change that Noah Kogut Levine, Ava Ramirez, and I have organized as part of our AP Environmental Science class taught by Professor James Smirk. Um, over the next six weeks, the series will feature four different speakers who will address a set of varied yet linked issues concerning global warming. Last week, we saw a lecture by TCNJ Professor Miriam Shikau, who took us through the politics of climate change. And this week, we'll cover climate change in our food system. And in the coming weeks, we'll learn about how tree rings serve as records of past climate change, how species extinction relates to climate change, and then also how sea level rise relates to climate change. Um, you can find all the details about the speakers and their lectures on our Instagram page, which is climate underscore Princeton. So the 2021 IPCC report by the United Nations determined that climate change is undeniably occurring today and is being caused by not just human activities, but preventable human activities. Something that's really struck us is how little people know about this phenomenon that threatens the very existence of humankind. Um, renowned author Jonathan Safran Foer has commented that the sheer magnitude of climate change has turned it into an unfathomable and abstract concept in our minds. We're unable to, un to adequately process the full scope of impacts that we will experience as a result of global warming. Furthermore, it is a common belief that climate change is an event that will occur in the distant future, not in our lifetime. However, there are already millions of people being displaced by and suffering from climate change today. This is a very urgent issue that every generation alive today will experience at some point and in some fashion. Even so, there are still many things we can do to prevent or minimize the consequences, which is why it's extremely important for us to learn what we can do to help and how we can replace our current habits with more sustainable ones. We hope that this lecture series will do exactly that and that people will leave knowing how to be better, better stewards of our planet, which is our only home. Uh, before my colleague Noah introduces our speaker today, I'd like to give you all some technical details about today's event. The lecture will last around 40 minutes, followed by a 20 minute Q&A session. We ask you to please submit your questions using the Q&A function at the bottom center of the Zoom window on your phone or computer screen. The lecture will also be recorded and subsequently posted on YouTube for public on-demand viewing. You'll be able to find the link to the recorded lecture on our website and we'll post a link to the website in the chat, but it can also be found on our Instagram page, climate underscore Princeton. And now Noah will introduce today's speaker and thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Grace. Um, so it is my great honor and a dream come true for me to introduce today's speaker, Swiss scientist, Dr. Thomas Nemesek. Dr. Nemesek is the deputy head of the Life Cycle Assessment Group at Agroscope, the Swiss Federal Center of Excellence for Agricultural Research. A life cycle assessment for anyone not familiar with this technical expression, is an analysis of the environmental impacts of a product throughout its entire life cycle, from farm to fork to garbage. Dr. Nemesek did his training in agricultural science at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, ETH, in Zurich, where he got a diploma as an agricultural engineer and a PhD in technical sciences. Among Dr. Nemesek's many publications, I would like to highlight the enormously important 2018 Oxford University Poor and Nemesek study, one of his most famous reports and a personal favorite of mine. This study looked at the life cycle of 40 different products in 38,700 farms in 119 different countries, which account for 90% of the food eaten globally. It is one of the most extensive studies ever conducted on agriculture's environmental impacts. Agriculture plays critical roles in environmental destruction as well as climate change. Thus, today's, today Dr. Nemesek will be talking about the environmental impacts of our food systems and how we can mitigate them. I can imagine you all are as eager as I am to hear what Dr. Nemesek has to tell us about this topic. And so without further ado, I hand him the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Noah and Grace, for this very nice introduction and for the invitation. It is a pleasure for me to uh, present to you some LCA results from, from the study that Noah just mentioned and from some other studies. So I have to share my screen first. Yes. Okay. 
So, no. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, thank you. So it is a pleasure uh, for me to present to you some studies about the environmental impacts of food, of our food system of nutrition, and what we can do about it. I will give a few introductory words on life cycle assessment for those that are not familiar uh, to it, then present a meta-analysis that Noah just mentioned, which was published in uh, Science. Then we will look into food production. We see that there is a lot of variability and it's even the distribution is skewed and this has some implications. Then we will look into animal and plant proteins and in particular meat uh, and the impacts uh, the, its production had. Then we will ask the question, what about organic food? Is, is organic the solution? And then think about diff different uh, mitigation strategies in food production. Then uh, we'll have a few words about supply chains, about seasonality, uh, contribution of different phases, or role of transports or food imports. Is it better to, to eat uh, regional, domestic, or imported food? And finally, we will look into diets. So what is the impact of changing diets on a global level and also from a Swiss study? So in short, the impact of the food system and of our nutrition on the environment is huge, but we can do something about it. So here uh, we have a summary of contribution of the food system to uh, environmental impacts. So we calculated that 26% of greenhouse gases are related to the food system. And there is another 5% uh, coming from non-food agriculture like cotton or biofuels. And if you look at other impacts, this can go up to 80% for eutrophication. So the food system has a very strong impact on the environment. And within this food system, animal products contribute between 55 and 60% to many impacts. It is more for land use and less for water use. And if you can compare that these impacts to the supply of protein and calories, you see that the impact is much higher than the protein and the calories that are produced from animal products. So we need to have a special look on animal products. So now I want to have a few words about life cycle assessment because I will present uh, results from different studies. So it calculates environmental impacts of products and processes. And we have two main applications. It's a hotspot analysis where you look in the whole chain in the product system, where are the main impacts, where are the, the emissions coming from? Or we compare different alternatives. So is it uh, better to have, uh, for example, beef from a beef system or beef from a dairy system? So this is a comparative LCA. We use model to calculate these impacts and the impacts are related to a functional unit. And we use it for uh, the method for environmental management. And there are three characteristics that uh, distinguish life cycle assessment from many other methods. It's first the consideration of the life cycle. So shown here from resources, production means like fertilizers, fuels, agricultural production, end of life, recycling, use phase. So everything should be included. So th this ensures that we do not shift uh, just the, the impacts elsewhere. So, okay, we reduce domestic food production and we import more. So we shift the, the impacts to other countries. We strive for a comprehensive analysis and try to have all relevant impacts as in the assessment. And this avoids that we shift environmental burdens from one impact category to another. And we relate it 
the impacts to a functional unit. So this, this is the reference for a comparison. This can be, for example, one kilogram, but we can also assess the nutritional value of food and have a more complex um, environment, functional units. Life cycle assessment is done in four phases. The goal and scope phase this is a very important one where we set the uh, system boundaries, we define the goal, we define the function unit, allocation uh, methods, etc. In the second phase, the life cycle inventory, we collect all the data on inputs and out outputs of so the technical production data. We link them to models to calculate direct emissions and to databases to calculate indirect emissions, mainly from upstream. So if a farm is buying inputs, for example, fertilizers, we take uh, the values from databases and you get a list of resources on the emissions related to your product system. The next phase, the life cycle impact assessment, you aggregate these uh, thousands of emissions and resources to impact categories like climate change or ecotoxicity. So for climate change, for example, we have CO2, methane and nitrous oxide uh, that are the most relevant for agriculture and they are calculated, transferred into CO2 equivalents. And in the interpretation phase, we draw conclusions, make recommendations, but we also check the uncertainty, the sensitivity to, uh, to changes in parameters, etc. So here is a, a schematic uh, graph how a life cycle of food is analyzed. So we have the upstream processes, agriculture production, Often we stop here at the farm gate, looking only at the agricultural production, but we also uh, often consider processing, storage, packaging, retail, then we have a, a, a system boundary at the point of sale. So if you have different products in a supermarket and you can also go to consumption and disposal. So what happens at home, how do you cook, how do you store your food in the fridge, etc. And at all steps, you have the use of resources, for example, energy, water, land resources, and you have emissions. And then you calculate all resources and all emissions along the life cycle. As mentioned, we did this uh, study in 2018 just published in Science. Uh, there was a comprehensive meta-analysis. Uh, we analyzed many different studies and uh, had contacts with different authors. We did harmonization, consolidation, and uh, filled data gaps. We uh, did randomization and resampling to get a representative sample weighted by country and production systems and uh, try to do a systematic quantification of variability. And we came up with five environmental indicators, climate change, so the greenhouse gas emissions, terrestrial acidification, eutrophication, land use, and water scarcity. So water scarcity is the amount of water use weighted by the water stress of the region where this water use occurs. So here are the results uh, from, for uh, three groups, starch, food, vegetables, and fruit from the study. And we show 80% of the production. So this bar uh, shows uh, between the 10th and the 90th percentile. So still 10% is lower and 10% is higher. And if you look into the ranges, you see that there is quite a wide range between the best and the worst producers. And we calculated that, uh, for example, for uh, greenhouse gases and land use, etc. And you see, for example, for greenhouse gases, there is a factor of four on average 
between the best and the worst producers. And if you take the best 5%, and the worst 5%, it's even a factor of eight. But this can be for some categories even much higher, especially for stress weighted water use, because there are huge differences between irrigated crops in arid areas and rain fed crops in areas where there is enough rain. So there are big differences between producers and products for the same product group. Now I uh, show two examples uh, why, where these differences come from. We have here for tomatoes, that was quite a wide range, uh, for example, and I compared here in blue, Dutch uh, tomatoes from greenhouses, heated greenhouses, and open field production in Spain in orange. And you can see the yield is six times higher in the greenhouse and the land use consequently six times lower. Also water use is three times lower. So in the greenhouse you use less water than in the open field. But on the other hand, the greenhouse gas emissions are six times higher in the uh, greenhouse production system, the heating greenhouses. So heating greenhouses uses a huge amount of energy and this changes dramatically the result. Another example is beef production. So I've taken some quite extreme cases here. We have German intensive bull fattening here in blue, uh, cult cows, so dairy cows, and uh, at the end of their life, they are cooked and uh, beef is produced and Brazilian extensive beef fattening. And we can see the Brazilian system used over 30 times more land to produce one kilogram of beef and uh, emits six times more greenhouse gases. So there are dramatic differences and they, are, uh, they have two main reasons. The dairy system, you produce milk and beef and uh, the emissions are shared between the both and most of the emissions are allocated to milk and therefore the system is more efficient. And the second reason is that the extensive system, uh, in the extensive system, the animals need longer, they, the growth is slow, they need longer to, to get the slaughtering weight. And during the, the lifetime, they emit more greenhouse gas because they also use more energy for maintenance. We have seen that the impacts are quite variable, but they are not only variable, they are also quite skewed. Here we calculated the share of the 25% of pro producers with the highest impacts. And we have seen almost half of the impacts are produced by just 25% of the producers. And this can be up to 80% for dairy products or for meat is also quite high. So this means if we uh, succeed to improve these producers with the 25% higher, with the highest impacts and bring them down maybe to the average, we would have a big effect. Or if that's not possible to reduce our consumption and take the produce uh, products or producers with the highest impacts out of production, then we would have a, a synergistic effect. We have seen there are a lot of differences within a product group, but we have also very high differences between different products. And this is especially true for animal-based uh, proteins and plant-based proteins. Here shown with the red line, we have meat, cheese, eggs, uh, fish, and if you uh, look at the greenhouse gas emissions and co compare them per 100 grams of protein, compare them to plant-based alternatives, we see that the impacts are much higher. And the same is true for acidification, eutrophication, 
land use uh, across all impacts. And also we can see that cow milk has higher impact than soy milk uh, with the same amount of protein. So there's a comparable uh, nutritional value. So by changing uh, our diet and replacing animal proteins by plant proteins, we can have a, a big reduction impact. Why are the, the impacts of animal products so high? We have a transformation of plant-based uh, feed to animal products, and we, we have losses of energy, we have losses of protein, of nutrients during this conversion. We have also contributions from land use change through feed production and also pasture sometimes. We have additional emissions from livestock production, methane, nitrous oxide, ammonia, etc., which contribute to environmental burdens. And during processing, uh, we see that only part of the animal body is used for human consumption, for example, from cattle, uh, life weight, we use only 35%, and 65% is either going to pet food or is is wasted. And we have also additional emissions from processing, for example, slaughterhouse effluents. But there are also big differences between different types of meat. And here I show results for five uh, types. It's beef from beef herd, from dairy herd, lamb and mutton, pig, uh, and poultry. And we can see it decreases for the ruminants have the highest impacts, followed by pork and followed by poultry. Poultry has the lowest of, of these. And there is also uh, quite a big difference between beef from the beef herd and from the dairy herd for the reasons I've just, just explained before. We can see a similar uh, pattern for land use, but here we have to say uh, poultry and pigs, and they are using mainly arable land, while for cattle, we use of often grassland. So the, there is also a large share of grassland. And we see a big difference between uh, beef and dairy herd. If we look at the water scarcity, we have quite a different picture. So the the beef from the dairy herd and pork has the highest impact. So it's important to look at the different impacts and to detect such trade-offs and see how we can deal with them. So the key drivers for environmental impacts of meat production is say the choice of the uh, production system. You have the example, the beef from the dairy herd or from the beef herd. And also animal-friendly production systems uh, have different impacts. I will come to that. The production efficiency is crucial. That's the fattening duration that counts the shorter, the better in principle. And this is closely related to the feed conversion efficiency. So how much feed is used for one kilogram of meat? And finally, the composition of the feed ration uh, is a key. Grass-based feed is in general uh, comes with lower impacts than concentrate-based feed, but this, this is a, has a trade-off with the production efficiency. The more concentrates you give, the, the more efficient it is, but concentrate itself has higher impacts. And the quality of the feedstuff also counts. So if you have low quality feedstuff, for example, the methane production is very high. Now, what about the different uh, production systems for, for meat? Here we, we did a, a study 10 years ago in Switzerland, and we compared the standard intensive conventional system with an animal friendly, a system, for example, free range chicken or a suckler cow system for, for beef and organic. And what we can see for beef and chicken, 
we have much higher impacts for the animal friendly and organic uh, system. And this is because these are more extensive. So we use more feed to produce one kilogram of meat in these systems. They have a longer fatting period. And for uh, cattle, the, uh, in the intensive system, the, the calves come from the dairy system and uh, from dairy cows and they are fattened. And in the animal friendly and organic system, they come from a suckler cow system. That means these cows are not uh, held for milk and the milk is used directly by the calf. So we have only beef as a product. But you can see, for example, for pork, there is only a very small difference. And this is because the, uh, in pork production, the efficiency is roughly the same across all system. So it depends on the, on the animal species and the context. So you really need, need to analyze your system to, to get the answer. And we have often the trade-offs between animal-friendly production and environmental impact. So often these animal-friendly systems have uh, higher emissions. Uh, also, they often use, for example, grassland. Still, they have quite high impacts. So we need to respect animal welfare. There is no, uh, no doubt. But we should keep the production efficiency high. So what about organic production? Uh, here is a meta-analysis. Uh, it's also uh, already 10 years old, but this, the results are still, still valid and confirmed by many other studies. Here we compare the ratio between uh, impacts of, of uh, conventional and organic. So if it's above the line, then the conventional system is better. If it's below the line, the organic system is better. So what is clear, the organic system uses more land because the yields are lower. It uses less energy, and it has to do with the uh, mineral nitrogen fertilizer, which is banned in organic farming and which uses a lot of energy. For greenhouse gases, there is not a systematic difference. Sometimes it's higher, sometimes lower, sometimes similar, but overall no change. And there is a tendency for higher emissions of nitrogen, phosphorus, so eutrophication, and acidification potential tend to be higher, but this depends really on the, on the system. Here is a German study that uh, analyzed what would happen if all Germans would eat an organic diet instead of a conventional one. So for the carbon footprint, there was no change, was uh, no reduction or increase by changing to an organic diet. For land use, as we have seen before, it would need more land. So an organic diet is not a solution uh, to protect the climate. So in summary, Organic farming has lower yields, so it needs more land. There is lower consumption of resources, energy, but also mineral resources like phosphorus and potassium. The impact on climate is similar. There is a tendency for higher acidification and eutrophication. On the positive side, we have a lower ecotoxicity from pesticides, so most pesticides are banned. Although we have to be careful with copper, because copper is not decomposed, is a metal and can be accumulated in the soil. We have positive effects on, for biodiversity and favorable effects of organic fertilizers on soil quality. So now I will say a few words about different mitigation options. And here I give an example of five different uh, wheat product productions from the meta-analysis study. And what you can see, the, all these are 
let's say, relatively successful. They have impacts below the median, so good, uh, low impact. And you can see the patterns are very different. So for example, the Australian conventional wheat, uh, to improve it, we should reduce emissions from mineral nitrogen fertilizers. The irrigated wheat in uh, Cyprus, we have high emissions from irrigation. It uses a lot of energy and therefore uh, we need, uh, we have high greenhouse gas emissions from energy consumption. And the German organic wheat, we have high emissions from organic fertilizers and from grain drying. So you can see all were quite successful, but uh, we're achieving this result in a very different way. So we need to analyze individually and uh, to look for specific solution for, for a specific situation. So what are the mitigation opportunities in food production? For crop production, we can say we should put the right crop at the right place. So we should avoid peat soils and deforested area because it's, uh, creates a huge greenhouse gas emissions. We have calculated, for example, for Switzerland, if uh, vegetables are grown on the organic, on a peat soil, they can have up to 15 times more emissions than if they are grown on a mineral soil. So this has a dramatic impact. We should avoid areas with endangered species, and we should avoid uh, putting crops with high water demand in arid zones. We should also avoid to having too low yields. We don't need a maximum yield, but we need a reasonably high yield. And if it's too low, it gets inefficient and we are not use, using the resources in the right way. And we should avoid unnecessary inputs. So over fertilization, uh, plant protection when it's not needed, uh, irrigating when it's not needed. So giving as much as needed, not less, but not more. For animal production was the choice of the production system, as I explained before. We should develop animal friendly and low emission uh, systems at the same time. Increase the feed conversion efficiency. This is really a key, how much feed is, is needed. And we should produce and feedstuffs with low environmental impacts and uh, make feed rations that are optimized for environmental impacts. And we should also in increase the use of byproducts for human consumption. So for example, nose to tail strategies, as it called, so use as much as possible of the animal body for human consumption. Now a few words about the supply chain and here uh, come to seasonal production. This is an example uh, from a study on cucumber. So if you look cucumber in Switzerland in summer uh, compared to cucumber from Spain, there is the energy uses for transport from Spain to Switzerland. So in this case, it is preferable to have this regional cucumber. But if you are out of season and it's grown in a heated greenhouse, then you see that there is a huge amount of greenhouse gases produced from heating. And in that case, it would be preferable to import cucumber from a country with a warmer climate or eat uh, regional and seasonal food is, uh, especially for vegetables, is a good, uh, a good way to, to uh, address this. So what about packaging? Many people are concerned about packaging and we should avoid packaging uh, that is not needed. That's true. But you can have over packaging that you put things that are not needed, but you can also have under packaging. And why is that? If you reduce packaging too much, you can increase losses because uh, yeah, 
maybe it gets damaged, it, it's, uh, it's not, no more conserved. And this study, they analyzed the ratio between the impact of uh, packaging and the contents. And you can see, for example, for ketchup, it's a factor of two. So the packaging is really quite important. But if you look, for example, on cheese and beef, animal products, it can go up to a factor of thousand. So the contents has much, much higher impacts than the packaging. And if you reduce the packaging and decrease the losses only a little bit, then you have a, a you did not a good choice because you will increase the overall impact. So we should be also careful with that. Food waste is quite a, a big issue. Here we did a study at, at Agroscope uh, about the potato chain. It's a uh, complex, but the most important figure is more than 50% is lost over the whole chain. So if you eat one kilogram of potatoes, it needs more than two kilogram of potatoes harvested uh, that you can, 2.1 kilogram of uh, potatoes need to be harvested to get one kilogram out. An important point is the losses are more important if they occur later in the supply chain. So losses at the agricultural stage is of course bad, but it's, it's much less than if you have losses in the household because all the emissions and all the steps before they are already occurred and then the damage is much higher if it's uh, wasted, for example, in the household or during consumption. This is again from the meta-analysis study and shows the impacts of different life cycle stages to selected products. So you can see that for some products, land use change has a very strong impact. This is, for example, the case for tofu, for soybean, for palm oil, for cane sugar. So this can uh, be very important. For some other products, it's not important. Then we have the crop production in green and the animal products, livestock production in yellow, of course, for the animal products. And together is land use change they make up the majority of the environmental impact. So agriculture production, including land use change, is most important. Packaging is less important than many people think, but can be quite important, for example, for beverages like beer. Transport is mainly important for uh, fruit, and vegetables for cool transport and for air freight, but it's, for example, not important for uh, products, for example, like cheese or beef, where the impacts of the products are so high that the transport does not add much to it. And the losses, as we mentioned here, they are important for all product groups, not of the same amount, but here is a really a big uh, option to, to reduce environmental impacts. So the agricultural phase dominates the impacts. Seasonality is matters, especially I would say for vegetables is really important for fresh vegetables. <clears throat> uh, food losses are important across all products. Packaging is less relevant. Uh, except for some products, and we must ensure a good protection of the products. And transports are mainly relevant for fruit, vegetables, and if it's transported by air freight. So not only the food miles, the distance matters, but the means of transport. And we have a difference of a factor of almost 100 between a transoceanic ship, which transports a huge amount of goods and the aircraft. Uh, there is a big difference. Inland water transport is, is a, has a bit higher impact, followed by railway and the road. 
So the means of transport is uh, quite crucial. That makes the difference. If you import food, the transport distances are longer. And many people think, OK, this is bad. We have a long transport distance. So the, the domestic product is automatically better. That's sometimes the case and sometimes not. For example, we have here a study from Switzerland and compared to imports from some other countries. And you see for wheat bread, there's not much difference and the transport does not add a, a lot to the uh, impacts. For cheese, the transport is almost negligible and the Swiss cheese scored quite well uh, in this study. And for beef, uh, the production system is much more important than the transports, except for air transport, as you can see here, this makes uh, a big difference. For potatoes, here it is true, the Swiss potatoes uh, are preferable because the transport uh, adds a lot to the environmental impacts. So it really depends on the product and it depends on the production system, but often it's more important how it's produced than where it comes from. As you can see here for the beef, it's a production system that makes these differences. So now I come to the consumption side and to changing diets. So what would happen is calculated on a global level. What would happen if we completely uh, take out the animal products from our diet and replace them by plant-based food? So we could reduce most impacts by about half, like greenhouse gas emissions, acidification, and eutrophication. And uh, we would also reduce land use, mainly grassland use. It would be less for arable land, but still we would have a reduction for arable land and reduction for freshwater uh, re uh, withdrawals, but it would be smaller. So overall, quite the big impact, but this is not a very realistic scenario that all people would ban the animal products. So we calculate the second scenario with halving, uh, cutting all animal-based products by half and removing the part of the production which has the highest impact. So here we have a synergistic effects and instead of 50%, it's roughly one third. Uh, instead of 25% of as we could expect because we have this synergistic effect. So here we can change our consumption and have uh, quite a lot of effect. We calculated uh, another study for Switzerland, what would be the optimal diet uh, in Switzerland from an environmental perspective, but still uh, satisfying all needs. And here we, uh, we included the, the environmental impacts and the nutritional value. And we required that the whole agriculture area in Switzerland is still used and it is 70% grassland. So we need animals. So it's not a, a vegan or vegetarian diet, uh, but a change, change diet. And we calculate different scenarios. I can skip the data details here. But overall, we found that for Switzerland, we could reduce the environmental impacts. It's accumulated uh, environmental impacts uh, by an endpoint methodology by about 50%. And the highest reduction you would have if you at the same time change the diet and redu reduce food waste, avoid food waste. The impact would be even lower for climate change. So the greenhouse gas emissions uh, would, would be reduced even more. This is maybe uh, uh, possible for Switzerland as we import a lot of food. So this gives more opportunities how to change and optimize the system. Uh, so at the global level, it might not be that much, but it shows we could, by changing our diet, 
uh, we could reduce a lot, and it's even not a vegetarian or vegan diet. Uh, as you can see here, the optimized diet would contain less meat, less alcohol, vegetable oils. It would have more cereals, potatoes, fruit and vegetables, legumes and peanuts, and uh, dairy product consumption would be about the same. And this is uh, mainly because we, on the one hand, we, we need some nutrients, but also we need the cows to uh, use the grassland. And that was a condition in the model. So for changing diets, we can conclude that even low impact animal-based products have generally higher environmental impacts than plant-based alternatives. But we have also to be careful because some of these substitutes have lower nutritional value. For example, if you replace cow milk by oat milk, this is a nutritionally uh, quite a different product and does not bring the same nutrients as cow milk does. And some ultra processed uh, substitutes can also have quite high environmental impact. So we have to be careful with that. Reducing consumption of uh, products with high impacts and at the same time avoiding the, the production of the produce from the producers with the highest impact creates a synergistic effects. And we have seen that for the Swiss population, we could reduce the environmental impacts by 50% by changing the diet and optimizing the system. And at the same time, this would be closer to the nutritional recommendation, so supposed to be more healthy. So here we have often a synergistic effect it would be better for the environment, better for our health. So come to the last slide. So agriculture has a large share on the environmental impacts and there is a lot of variability which creates mitigation opportunities for producers. We need context specific solutions. So there is not the one solution, you apply it everywhere and it works and it brings uh, the best results. That's unfortunately uh, not the case. We have often trade-offs, so we need to show them and uh, in a comprehensive analysis and address these trade-offs and try to find solutions. And on the consumer side, can reduce the consumption of animal-based foods, mainly meat, uh, reduce food waste as something that we can, we all can do and has a, a very big effect and no trade-offs should prefer local and seasonal production, especially for vegetables, I would say, avoid food transported by air and from uh, heated greenhouses. Also prefer less processed food and <clears throat> choose products with low environmental impacts. But for that, we need to know which ones have low environmental impacts. I've shown there is a lot of variability. And if you go to the shop, you cannot see it. Is it a good product or is it a bad product? Therefore, we need to provide this information uh, along the supply chain to the re retailers, to the processors and to the consumers. So we need all actors in the supply ch chain from the producers to all the actors in between to the consumers that we can ag address this huge challenge. Thank you very much for your attention. And in my slides, I have also the references here for those who want to have more information. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Nemesic. That was really interesting. Um, a lot of that I didn't know. So it was really cool to learn a lot. Uh, we're going to head into the Q&A. So we have two questions here. Um, so I can read the first one to you whenever you're ready. Yep. Okay. Um, you point out that the different environmental impacts of beef from dairy herd versus beef herd sources, but since, unless I'm mistaken, the beef consumer cannot know from which type of herd their beef is coming from, what does this distinction mean pragmatically for people who still choose to eat meat? 
Okay, I'm not so familiar with the situation in the US, um, but there are uh, labels, for example, uh, for uh, this uh, meat coming from suckler cows. Uh, for example, in Switzerland and other countries, we have labels, so you you can uh, and you can often know it. Not not in all cases if it's not. Uh, from uh, having a label, you cannot be sure, but in, yeah, probably in most cases, it is possible to, to find out. So for example, uh, if you have a, a beef burger, this often comes from, uh, from dairy cows, at least in Europe. I'm not sure about the US. <laughs> Uh, maybe the dairy cows have less less meat, so also the type of meat uh, plays a role. But if you have a steak, for example, this does not come from a dairy cow. This comes from young animals. Okay, thank you. And then we have one more question. Um, you talked about how organic prog products are not necessarily better for the environment and are worse in some impacts. I was wondering if you have studied traditional methods of farming certain products, especially by indigenous peoples, and what the impact of that looks like versus the actual feasibility of producing enough food to feed the world with those methods. Um, maybe not indigenous people, but we had, for example, one project uh, where let's say, traditional methods uh, were studied, uh, partly organic, partly not. Um, it, it really depends. Some were, uh, were quite good and others were uh, had a higher impact than a conventional system. So it is difficult to, to, uh, uh, to give it a generic answer. What we often observe, if the yield is too low, then it's quite difficult to, to still, still uh, have an efficient system and a low impact. But then high, yeah, a higher yield is not necessarily better. So it really depends on the, on the inputs and the emissions in, in uh, related to the yield. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, we have two more, we have some more questions here. Oh, um, no, do you want to do them? Sure, I can read them. Um, so, so someone says, thank you for this talk. I was fascinated to learn that farmed crustaceans like shrimp are much less environmentally friendly than farmed fish. Can you tell us why this is? Um, that was for the, for the shrimps, the, the main point was that uh, the methane emissions, okay, the shrimps are, are grown in, in, uh, in, uh, warm, uh, in warm climate, so they need a quite high uh, water temperature, while uh, farmed fish is often uh, in, in cool waters. And the methane emissions from these ponds were quite high because there is quite a lot of organic uh, matter. Uh, in the, in the water, and this creates a lot of uh, methane emissions, and it depends on temperature. So it's yeah, uh, effect mainly effect of temperature, and it seems that this was a little bit underestimated until now. That is very interesting to know. Thank you so much, Dr. Nemesek. Uh, another question here is. Uh, you suggest in your last slide that the consumer needs to know about the environmental impacts of the foods she is consuming. How can one pragmatically uh, increase the availability, the, availability, the availability of such information by means of legislation? Are there other strategies? Um, good question. Um, um, the European Union, for example, has a uh, an initiative since uh, a few years, they are developing a system called Product Environmental Footprint, so that you 
uh, producers have uh, clear rules how to calculate and how to inform about environmental impacts. Uh, it shows it's not it's not easy. And also, if the the environmental impacts are calculated by the retailer and declared by the retailers, you must make sure that there is no greenwashing and they cannot uh, 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 cheat about the, the results. So you need very clear rules. Um, this will be introduced on a voluntary basis. And, but uh, there are many initiatives of retailers, for example, that putting the, such information on, on their products so that consumers can, can know it. So I think we, we need uh, such information for consumers, but also for, for the uh, retailers, for the buyers, for the processors, so that they can choose the products with low environmental impact. Do you think that uh, you uh, pr providing the producers with monetary incentives to be more environmentally friendly would work, like implementing uh, taxes on the highest impact producers and stuff like that? Probably that that would uh, would be effective if the taxes are high enough. Uh, it's probably not easy to implement because it will not be. Uh, yeah, maybe not very well received by uh, by many people. Yeah. Um, I have some questions myself here. So um, given that we already uh, grow enough crops to feed a global population of 12 billion people, if we were not using the bulk of those crops to feed livestock, um, your 2018 Oxford study found that a vegan world would reduce agricultural land by 75%, which would free up an area the size of Africa and essentially end deforestation while still growing enough food to meet the nutritional demands of our entire current population. So I was wondering, um, what do you think would be the best uses of all that land being used in animal agriculture today that would be freed up in a vegan world? For example, um, I learned in a lecture by your collaborator, Joseph Poor, that we could increase the carbon sequestration potential of the soil of those lands if we used technology like bioenergy carbon capture and storage instead of just planting trees. So what do you think would be like the best uses that we could do with that land? Okay, I think also it, it depends on, uh, on, on which region. Uh, we probably not one single use, but uh, we have today a very high pressure on biodiversity and uh, many species are endangered. Uh, and part of that area should be used to, to create natural areas and to protect uh, biodiversity. And another part uh, should be used to, to uh, store carbon. It, uh, yeah, reforestation or, uh, yeah, and one option uh, that also seems quite promising is, is biochar, producing biomass and uh, converting it to biochar uh, can have qu uh, quite positive effects and you can store carbon for many centuries in the soil. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I have several more questions. Uh, that This lecture was very oh. interesting. Uh, so um, forgive me if this right now seems like a somewhat longish question, but this topic is a particular passion of mine, and I've long wanted to get your thoughts on this specific question I'm about to ask. So um, before I ask, I would like to provide some context. So a lot of people defending the animal agriculture industry refer to holistic grazing as a sustainable solution, you know, regenerative animal agriculture. But the 2017 Grazed and Confused report by the Food Climate Research Network a division of Oxford University, found that uh, soil grazed by animals can only offset 
20 to 60 percent of the gases emitted by the animals themselves. And after a few decades, the soil reaches soil carbon saturation and can no longer sequester any more carbon, which makes this not really a good alternative for reducing emissions. And also the drawdown report found that shifting to a plant-based diet is four times as powerful in carbon capture potential than shifting to managed livestock grazing. So I was wondering, given this information, I would like to know your professional opinion on the feasibility and sustainability of holistic grazing, or whether we should just resort to vegan regenerative agriculture instead through practices like uh, crop rotation, no-till intercropping, and green manures like biocyclic hummus soil. Okay, uh, yeah, uh, interesting and complex uh, questions. Um, one thing which is much debated is how much uh, carbon is stored in uh, grassland soils, grazed or yeah, even uh, if, it's, if it, there is cutting. Um, and some studies, uh, this is quite debated in scientific literature. Some studies, uh, they find uh, that carbon is stored in grassland, let's say continually, it's in the carbon content is increasing. Uh, and this can offset part of the emissions of the animal system. Um, we are, let's say, the, we have uh, discussed this and analyzed this in, in detail. And at Agroscope, we are not convinced that this really happens on a large scale. In some cases, yes, in some, some soils can increase carbon, some can lose carbon, it depends also a lot on the history. Um, so basically we assume in most cases that if you uh, don't change uh, cultivation or the management, the carbon will remain stable. So there will be no increase. If you convert grassland to arable land, you lose carbon. If you uh, convert arable land to grassland, you can store more carbon. So that's known. Um, so yeah, we are with we don't think that this uh, happens on a large large scale, and uh, but it is uh, it is debated. There is uh, yeah, there is uh, not an an animus uh, uh, opinion in the scientific um, world. The other question is, should we, uh, let's say, completely ban our animals and uh, let's say only, only vegan nutrition? I'm personally, I don't think that's uh, the solution. So what we should do is reduce uh, meat consumption quite strongly, but we have uh, in the world, we have about 70% of the agricultural land is grassland and currently only animals can use it. Part of it can be used for arable land, but uh, quite a large share of that land cannot be used for crops. So what should we do there? And the most efficient way of using this land is by milk production. This is much more efficient than beef production. And then we would have milk as a main product and as a byproduct, a uh, much smaller amount of beef. So uh, also animal products, they bring uh, a lot of nutrients that can be replaced to some extent, uh, but yeah, we have to also to be careful. If somebody wants uh, to be vegetarian and vegan, that's uh, everybody's choice. But we should also be, be careful about that. The small amount of, of animal products is probably uh, not a bad, bad idea to have there in our diet. So that's my, let's say my, my vision would be uh, reduce the, um, the consumption of meat quite drastically, favor uh, 
milk production on grassland uh, with uh, and only byproducts from the food industry that are not suitable for food should be used to feed animals and not uh, should not be competing our nutrition. So that's how I see it. A long answer, <laughs> but it's a complex question. Yeah. Thank you. That was a really thorough answer. Yeah. Um, I have one more question. So you mentioned that uh, the amount of nitrogen fertilizers and irrigation that we use today in agriculture is uh, very destructive for the environment. So I was wondering, how would you uh, suggest people reduce the amount of nitrogen fertilizer being used and the amount of irrigation that's used? Mm. Um, yeah, we we need uh, we need nitrogen to produce. That's for sure. We can uh, we can grow more legumes to bring uh, nitrogen in the system. It's probably not not enough. Um, in the future, probably we would need some uh, uh, technologies to produce um, nitrogen fertilizers without fossil fuels. But what we need uh, for, for nitrogen fertilizers is, is hydrogen. Hydrogen today is, is, uh, comes from natural gas. So natural gas is used to produce hydrogen, to produce ammonia. But we could do that, do that with solar panels and, and uh, electrolysis. And irrigation. That's uh, this will be a big challenge. So we need to use the water uh, very efficiently. We will need irrigation in the future, and if climate change, probably the drought will will increase. But we have also need to use uh, water saving uh, technologies, for example, drip irrigation, etc. That's one way, and another way is uh, say more closed systems. For example, this uh, say urban agriculture, like vertical agriculture, which is using nutrients and uh, and water much more efficiently. But on the other hand, you need a lot of infrastructure and you need a lot of energy. So you need renewable energy. So uh, there are ways to to address this, but it's uh, it's a huge challenge. Thank you so much for that answer. Um, I have one more question. Uh, so how would you say? What would you say are the best ways to address? food loss, because um, I did some research on that a few weeks ago for a project for class as well. And I found some studies that show that because of the very inefficient feed conversion ratio for livestock, uh, livestock is actually one of the main causes of food loss in the production part of the mm -hmm. process. And uh, I also found a study published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences uh, two years ago that found that uh, if the US went vegan, uh, the amount of food that could be produced directly to humans would be so much more that it would make up for all the food loss that occurs in the entire system today. So I was wondering if you have, if what, what are the best ways to reduce food loss given this information? Uh, there's probably not one single uh, way, but for example, uh, vegetable production there is quite a lot of uh, of food loss food, food, food loss and food waste um, part of the vegetables that grows is not harvested because there is uh, there is not the, the demand or at the right time that's one thing so even if it's perfect quality but often the, the producers they need to produce you more because the weather can change and sometimes it grows faster, sometimes slower. Uh, and the, the, 
the buyer has a quantity that he ordered and if you produce more it's wasted and then it's a question of quality uh, sometimes we have okay if there is uh, some spot on the on the fruit so we we cannot sell it or it's a bit too big or too small but it's perfect you can eat everything no problem but it's not uh, that perfect quality we we expect but last year for example we had a very bad summer vegetables were growing uh, were not growing well it was too wet they couldn't harvest and it was really it was expensive and they were selling vegetables that were not having the quality that they normally would have and because there was not nothing else people bought it and and uh, they have eaten it so it is possible but we, here we have a need a little bit more tolerance and um, for example for the animal body we can uh, uh, we can eat much more than we do currently and you just have to take uh, the cookbooks of our grandparents and they have all the recipes so uh, yeah it, it is because we can afford it to waste so much food uh, it is done because uh, we have plenty of food so it doesn't matter so that's that's a little bit the point and of course your your personal behavior that you buy only what you what you need and you uh, you don't throw away if you if you cook too much so you can eat it the, sec, uh, the next day or the day after um, yeah so there are many different options thank you that was a very interesting answer uh, i'm afraid we're gonna have to end the q a here uh, before <laughs> We wrap up i would like to say a few concluding words so i'm gonna share my screen and um so first and foremost i want to thank dr nemesek for such a captivating and compelling lecture this is indispensable information that uh everyone should know about i would also like to thank everyone for coming and listening and engaging the talk through your questions and comments um, among the many things that we have learned from today's lecture is that diet and environmental issues are inextricably linked, that our current food system is entirely unsustainable, and that massive restructuring is necessary for protecting our planet and securing our global food supply. With your indulgence, I'd like to um, briefly unpack what I see as an important ramification of this line of thinking, which strikes me as a strong eco-political argument for veganism. Let me explain what I mean. Um, so as bi a business as usual scenario will make it impossible to prevent a global warming of 1.5 degrees and extremely hard to prevent a warming of two degrees while causing catastrophic environmental destruction. And this is largely due to our consumption of animal products. Animal agriculture alone emits more greenhouse gases than the entire transportation sector. Whereas humans have, may have been able to eat animals freely for the past, for many centuries before, when the global human population was comparatively small, today, with a population approaching 8 billion, eating animal products is unsustainable as it requires too many resources for too small an output of food. Thus, diet change is essential to protect the environment and address climate change. But what does this mean concretely for each of us as individuals? Well, Slowly and progressively reducing our consumption of animal products has major environmental and health benefits, while also making our consumption more ethical. For example, start by no longer eating meat. Try some of the numerous readily available plant-based alternatives, such as Beyond Meat or Impossible Foods. Then, slowly remove milk or eggs from your diet, trying plant milks instead. Even though any reduction in your animal consumption is beneficial, a vegan diet is unequivocally the single most effective way to reduce your individual environmental impact. Moreover, contrary to popular belief, a vegan diet is perfectly healthy and nutritionally adequate for all stages of life, including pregnancy, 
as demonstrated by research from the American Dietetic Association, the world's largest organization of nutritionists. If the prospect of going vegan seems daunting, trust me, it's in fact easier than it might, you might expect, especially with the tools available to us today. Uh, as Dr. Nemesek has said, you have to be careful because there are some products that are less nutritious than animal products. However, a properly planned vegan diet can be easily planned and easily healthy and nutritionally adequate. One thing that really helped me when I went vegan was a website called challenge22.com, which provides you with uh, professional nutritional guidance and customized diet plans all for free. Grace will put it in the chat for everyone. Um, a vegan diet also has the potential to massively reduce agricultural land use, to eliminate both deforestation and world hunger, and to address other issues, including but not limited to species extinction, eutrophication, desertification, and more. Switching to a vegan diet reduces your entire carb carbon footprint by a whopping 28%. Indeed, the environmental and climate benefits of a vegan diet far outweigh the benefits of switching to an electric car or reducing your amount of airplane travel. In short, veganism is the most powerful way to minimize the harm you inflict onto the world. Before we conclude this event, I would like to also remind you all that we will be hosting three more lectures in the upcoming weeks, and we very much hope you will be able to join us for many of them. Please note that all the remaining lectures will take place at 5 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. You can find all the information about these remaining talks on our Instagram page, climate underscore Princeton. Thank you for your time, everyone, and sincere thanks once again to our speaker, Dr. Nemesek. Good afternoon, and for those of you in Europe, good evening.